I want to talk about Bethany Frankel's book, Business is Personal, because I started listening to it on Audible. That's why you haven't seen me like post pictures of it. I think I posted like a screenshot on my Instagram story. Anyway, I've been reading it and it's not what I expected at all. Okay. It's actually really good. It's better than I expected. It's very juicy for like true Bethany fans. Like if you liked her on on Orange, uh, not Orange County, if you liked her on Real Housewives of New York, if you liked the, if you watched The Big Shot, if you're a fan of Skinny Girl, if you read any of her books, like this is a real good book for Bethany. Um, I'm only into the first like five or six chapters. But even within that, there's like a lot in there. Um, She talks about Real Housewives of New York. She talks about The Big Shot. She talks about like all these little things. If you've caught any of my previous uh, breakdowns of Bethany and like The Big Shot and stuff like that, or the episodes that I've done with like Jess Rothschild or Jacques Peterson, um, this will be a good like catch up to hear what Bethany has to say about a lot of these things. Um, So to start, we'll, we'll recap some of like the juiciest parts of the book. Ultimately, the book is supposed to be about like business and and um, building a personal brand and whatever, but it's not really about that. Like it, it is a lot more of like, I guess she talks about some of our business deals, but let's let's get into it. Um, okay, so big thing related to Roni is she said that part of the reason she left Roni is because they wanted to change a clause in her contract that would uh, make it so that she only got paid for every episode that she appeared in. So she would get an episodic rate, which is pretty is the direction that Bravo seems to be going in. And this is how they're getting their talent to kind of really step it up by being involved in the mix and having really strong storylines, because then if you're not in an episode, you don't get paid for it. And so in this case, it, it should be paid an episode rate versus a salary rate, rate, which she said that she didn't like because she's like, I know what I bring to the table. I know what I deliver. They know that I deliver. And, you know, I'm not going to settle for an episode rate or have the the chances of being cut out of an episode and then not get paid for doing my job this season. And apparently it came up because of Lisa Vanderpump and Nene Leakes, how they pulled out of doing several episodes episodes in their final seasons um but they like lisa vanderpump still got her housewife salary contract i don't know if she got the full thing i would imagine well i don't know but anyway they want to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen and housewives get paid for whatever episodes they appear in to really just encourage them to bring it similar to what they did with vanderpump rules not this last season but the season prior is when they introduced that to all of their cast members and stopped paying them on a, a seasonal salary so said that she didn't like that. uh, And she said that it was ultimately just no longer good for her brand or for her image. So she walked away from millions. She keeps saying that millions throughout the whole book. She talks about all the millions that she walks away from all the time um, and said that housewives paid her really well. But she was she just she was done. She notes that she would do this wasn't in the book, but this was in an interview she did with Hoda. Hoda. And who's the other girl? Samantha. I don't know. Whoever. Whoever. Yeah, Samantha Bush, isn't that her? I don't know. But the girl that hosts, the woman that hosts the morning show, the Today Morning Show with Hoda, Bethany was just on that to promote her book. And she said that she would actually do, she she didn't say ultimate girls trip necessarily, but she would do some sort of mashup type of show. She's like, but I would only do it if it were with the Mount Rushmore of Housewives, which she doesn't think will ever happen. But she's like, it would need to be Teresa. It would need to be Nene and it would need to be Lisa Vanderpump. And even if that were the case, she would consider it, but she wouldn't actually sign. Obviously, then at that point, money would be a factor. But she's like, that's the only thing housewives related at this point I would ever consider. She said she's not doing legacy. She's not doing regular Ultimate Girls Trip. That that's just not within the the realm of what she's interested in. But if there was a project that involved Teresa, Nini, and Lisa Vanderpump, then you know she considers them to be the four Mount Rushmores of housewives. I think Lisa Vanderpump is a little overrated, to be honest. Um, so I wouldn't consider her one of the Mount Rushmore housewives necessarily. Uh, Vicky, I think, would be a great Mount Rushmore housewife, right? Um, I guess she would be the New York one. Nini's Atlanta, Teresa's Jersey, Lisa Vanderpump, she says, would be Beverly Hills. I feel like Kyle may kind of have that title now. Kyle may not bring as much as Lisa brought in terms of like the zingers. And I don't know. I think Kyle's great. I like Kyle. Some people find her boring, but I enjoy Kyle. I think Kyle would definitely be in the Mount Rushmore. Um, but yeah. She said that's that's what she would consider. Anyway, back to the book. She also said that she's um, currently in the process of trying to buy back Skinny Girl Cocktails because she believes that Beam 
drove it into the ground in her opinion that there was so much potential and they gave her so much money, but they just don't care about it. And she said that they told her that directly, that skinny girl is not a priority for them. And they basically don't give a fuck about it, that they only bought it um, to impress one of their other potential partners and that they really don't care to do anything with it. So she's like, well, then let me buy it back. Let me buy it back at a discounted rate. Let me buy it back at, you know, she's just trying to get, well, I don't even know if she has that kind of money though to be able to just buy back Skinny Girl. But I guess if they really don't care about it and it's not a priority for them and they're not really doing anything with it, then why not just sell it off to her for, you know, a few million? They sold it to her. I mean, they sold it to her for a lot of money. And I know she doesn't have that kind of money to just be competing with Beam to get it, but who knows? If they really don't care about it, give her her fucking Skinny Girl back and I'm pretty sure she can do something. Like, that was the thing that I was thinking. Like, why not take Skinny Girl into the seltzer market? Like, Skinny Girl was one of the first ready-to-drink cocktails. They should have been one of the first to enter into the seltzer or canned cocktail market, and they could have really gone somewhere with it. And I think they'll probably do a lot better in the canned cocktail market rather than in the bottled cocktail market because nobody's really doing bottled cocktails at this point. She talks about becoming a podcast mogul and how Andy Cohen is the one that encouraged her to make this move into podcasting. She says that her her deal with MGM actually fell through because of her podcast, which I don't know if I necessarily believe. She said that they wanted to own her podcast, that they wanted exclusivity. And at the time that she launched her podcast, it was originally with Endeavor because MGM didn't really care about podcasting. They didn't really think it was going to do it. It was anything spectacular. So she's like, okay, well, I'll talk to Endeavor and see if I can get them to get me a a podcast deal because they were really eager to work with her. And so she said that she disclosed this to MGM and they didn't really care about it at first. And they're like, yeah, fine, go do your little podcasting with Endeavor. But then she ultimately left Endeavor and signed with iHeartRadio. And she left Endeavor while she she launched the show with Endeavor, they didn't finalize a contract. And she's like, well, that's common. We, you know, you often go into deals and don't finalize contracts, but then you already technically were under the, imp- gave them the impression that you were moving forward with them, even though you didn't finalize the contract. Like there were still little negotiations that for you to just pull and take the show entirely and then go and sell it to iHeartRadio, that was crazy. That was crazy. Um, And Endeavor wasn't very happy about that. And it seemed like MGM wasn't happy about that either. But her MGM deal was strictly about producing content for television and obviously streaming networks like HBO Max. Um, And her deal with MGM, she was specific that it doesn't involve hosting. It only involves producing. And it doesn't specify anything about podcasting necessarily, which is why she was able to do what she did with Endeavor. Because she was like, well, I'm not technically a producer. I'm just a host of this podcast. Um, So I'm not producing any content. I'm just hosting content. But she ultimately saw Endeavor as Small Potatoes. And she took her show over to iHeartRadio because she thought that they could do more for the podcasting world than Endeavor could. MGM then wanted in because she said it was such a lucrative podcast that how could MGM not want in on this? But it's also like, what did you expect? Like you signed an exclusivity deal with MGM. Like I would jump at an exclusivity deal with MGM. I would jump at that in two fucking seconds. Most people in podcasting are trying to pivot into bigger things outside of podcasting. We're trying to build into the world of TV and film and business. Like that's where you want to go. You don't, you go from podcasting to MGM. You don't start at MGM and then go down to podcasting. Even Stassi in her book talks about um, her deal with Sony and how, I mean, ultimately that ended up getting canned and it was canceled when she was canceled, but that she started on a reality show and then she went into podcasting and then it started it, it turned into her book and the book deal ultimately led to this animated series deal that she had with Sony and that was major and she's like I wanted to do more of that I was ready to leave reality TV to go and do bigger production stuff and I was going to produce a series with Sony you know she it just it makes no sense to me what Bethany is is doing like nobody leaves a television production deal to go and host a podcast in their closet I say that as a true podcaster because Bethany's literally in her closet um, with no makeup on and she has her daughter Bryn come and co-host with her sometimes. And it's just like, it's so informal and it's not, I mean, and some of the best podcasts can be and are informal. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't think it's a great podcast. But she said that when MGM saw how successful her podcast was, they wanted a piece of her, of her pie 
And she said that uh, she said, no, she didn't want to give them a piece of the pie because iHeart had bigger and better resources to support her podcast. But I think leaving MGM was a stupid decision. They could have done more for her in the long run than what I think iHeart can provide for her in this current lap, you know, in this current mile. The long run, I think working something, making the MGM deal work and making them happy, I think would have paid off so much more down the line. The fact that they were even interested in signing a deal with her was huge. And the fact that she allowed her ego to blind her and be like, I know better. I'm taking my podcast and I'm doing my thing. And now she said that her podcast is her dream job. But like, I mean, come on, if I'm being honest, I really don't think she's done anything unique in the podcast space. She hasn't done anything groundbreaking. She doesn't have groundbreaking numbers. She doesn't have, you know, really deep or great thought-provoking interviews. Like, it's just, it's not very great, you know? She had bigger and better guests when she was with Endeavor, which is when she launched the show. She had Paris Hilton. She had Mark Cuban. I think Mark Cuban, she brought in herself personally, but she had Paris Hilton. She had Hillary Clinton. And we know she didn't pull Hillary Clinton on her own. You know, Hillary Clinton is huge. Endeavor made that happen for her. She hasn't had anybody at the caliber of Hillary Clinton on her podcast since then. No, she has Bryn on her podcast now. She does rants and it's literally like she doesn't even have a nice formal set. It's literally like a very low, like my setup looks way more professional than her setup looks. And that's saying a lot. And that is not a podcast mogul. That's no. You can call Joe Rogan a podcast mogul, but let's be clear. She's no Joe Rogan. You can call Alex Cooper a podcast mogul because she took Call Her Daddy from this little podcast into, you know, this mega deal that she signed with Spotify. She's built a whole army of supporters and people. Bethany doesn't have that type of loyalty um, with her audience that Rogan and Cooper have. Uh-uh. I just, I thought, I, you're, and, uh, she says that she wanted to find like the perfect part the perfect podcast partner, but like you're never going to find the perfect podcast partner. And, you know, you have to look at the long game. You have to look at the bigger picture. You have to play your cards right. And you have to know that like you're never going to have the perfect podcast partner, but you have to at least go with the partners that are strategically going to help you move to the bigger opportunities down the line. And Bethany talks about, about it a lot in her book about how, you know, you have to look at the whole board game. You have to look at where you're going. But I'm like, there are a lot of like rash decisions that she makes. And she talks a lot about, Trusting her gut, which I think is good. You should absolutely trust your gut. But I don't think she understands this space that well. And she's not surrounding herself with people that really understand the space that well. And listen, the only people that really understand the space are the people that have been in this space long enough. And a lot of people are still new to this space because it's still a growing space. She's a shark. She loves a good deal. Money motivates her. But I think she's a little reckless when with some certain things. And I think she jumps a little too fast. And that's ultimately biting her in the ass. Um and I think right now she's trying to put her hand into too many pots and she's not really cultivating much in one specific area. And it's a little all over the place. Buying back Skinny Girl, I think, would be smart. I don't think Beam is going to sell it back to her, but I think that would be a smart decision for her. Um, she also talks about, uh, she said that she ultimately asked out of her MGM deal so that she could be a free agent and do her podcast all on her own and sign with iHeartRadio. I don't know how much truth I believe that to be. I think she was difficult to work with. And I think MGM was probably like, yeah. Trust me, if they really saw the value in her lucrative podcast, they would have fought to keep her. They wouldn't have fought to let her just sail off into the sunset if her podcast was truly that valuable to them. But they only ended up producing the big shot with her, and that was for HBO Max. And she she talks a lot about that in the book as well. She says that one point she want, like wanted to make them scrap the entire show and rework the entire course of it because what they originally shot was so bad and it wasn't good and it wasn't authentic. And she would like yell at some of the cameramen and be like, "This is what you need to be like me fumbling to get into the door and not being able to get into my house because I don't have my key. This is what you need to be filming. This is what you need to be getting because this is good television. This is good content." And I'm just like, Ugh. but then she also talks about like her social media team and how she has like a person that's like dedicated towards finding trends and doing things for her and executing that for her. I'm like, so then how good at con- building content are you? She's a great personality and she's a great reality star. Um, 
after reading this book, I don't know how much I trust her skills in business. You know, Carol Radswell has also talked a lot about how she's had a lot of licensing deals. I think in terms of business, I think she's good at making money and she's good at negotiating deals. I don't necessarily think that she's the best businesswoman, so to speak. She's a good personal brand and she had a, uh, she's a great personality and I think people connect to that. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting, though, because she, she even wanted to recast the entire show, which I find really interesting because I remember when I was originally in talks with the show's producers to join the show as a contestant on The Big Shot, they told me that we were all going to be living in a house together um, and that they wanted to know like what I what it would be like for me to be living with other people. And as we know, that wasn't the case with The Big Shot. They all ended up staying in hotel rooms and it was shot in an office. And a lot of it changed at the last minute. And she said that a lot of the moments that where she was like changing things up and mixing up the show as we go. And it was kind of like this chaos, you know, chaotic ride that nobody really knew what to expect. And even the producers like never knew what she was actually going to do at the end of the day. And she like kept doing crazy stuff like that. So that that definitely kept everybody on their toes. But it definitely made it interesting for audience members. But then she gets into the rosé. Okay, and if you watch The Big Shot, then you'll know that the finale centered around the launch of this rosé. Um, but the rosé, the name of the rosé was blurred out. She didn't say the name on the show. It seemed like it was unintentional. Um, and it was just strange that there was no grand reveal of what the rosé actually was, but the whole finale was centered around this rosé. And remember earlier when she was talking about leaving Endeavor and how, you know, sometimes in business you go into certain deals and you start things, but if the contract isn't signed, you know, we still are working out the details and sometimes that's normal. I told you, what was it on last week's episode? I was like, no, you always get the signature on the dotted line before moving forward. And that is your power because that's that's your paycheck. That's the obligation of the other party to actually pay you. That's your, or if you're the one paying in the contract, then that protects you from having to pay more than, you know, what you may end up having to pay. Like there, you always, like that to me is one of the worst pieces of advice in business that she talks about in the book is, you know, just starting projects without actually finalizing all the details because she gets into what happened with the Rosé company and um, why it was blurred out. And so basically she found a wine company that she was going to invest in and help rebuild from scratch. And it was a good Rosé and whatever. She found the brand that had the name that she wanted and really liked, and she was going to do a whole big splash, and she said she was going to disrupt the wine uh, business the way she disrupted the liquor business with Skinny Girl, and she did something new, and she's going to see if lightning can strike twice, but then the wine never got announced, and she ended up doing a sponsored post for this company called Forever Young Wines, and it was like an entire wine line that was already established and been established for many years versus this new rosé that she was bringing to the market herself. So apparently it's all because she was striking a deal with the original creator of that rosé, but they were still in talks and they were still in negotiations, right? And she apparently went and took their name and started trademarking it in other categories, other beverage categories. I want to say she mentions like maybe a liquor category, um, but she started trademarking that name in other areas. And her partner was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what are you doing? And why are you trademarking all of these things outside of you know, this wine that we're doing and why is my name not like, this was the name that I originally conceived. Why is my name not included on all these other things? And she's like, well, I'm just thinking of the bigger picture. I'm thinking of the way we can extend and grow this brand beyond just this wine. And he's like, well, that's great, but you have to include me in this. And she's like, no, I don't. I'm, you can have the wine, but I'm going to have this and that and this and that with all these other, you know, buckets that I want to get. And then the wine partner was like, no, that's not happening. You don't get to just take my name and leave me with a small potato while you're taking the whole pot of pot roast. Like, no, that's not how this works. And she, she the partner was upset and backed out and, you know, it was done. But it's like, why would you cut him out of having access to other categories under the same name without even consulting with him? Like that to me is like not good business. And she said that she had a bigger vision for it. But he said, nope, not going to happen. The deal was squashed. Um, and another bad deal in my head. I think, you know, getting back into the liquor business or the alcohol business, starting with wine is a questionable choice. Wine is very competitive and wine is a very, trust me, as somebody that has a wine line and understands a lot of the inner workings of it, it's not easy. Um, yeah, I, I don't. 
I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, because the Forever Young thing was a total flop and it looked so bad for her brand. Now knowing the whole story, it's even worse to know that she really fucked up this other deal and then it ended up just becoming this Forever Young sponsored Instagram post um, because it was like an endorsement deal that she ended up signing to cover her ass because the big splash that she was making on the big shot fell through because she didn't have a signed contract and she wasn't fully open and didn't disclose everything to her partner. So... (sighs) <sighs> she does have some wins though because she talks about trademarking the name food porn i remember when food porn first came out and i was like oh that's interesting bethany's going into like producing content now um but apparently she trademarked the name food porn and thought that, that would be a good idea for her to invest in or do something with later on down the line but then there was an actual show that was in development called food porn and they needed the trademark and she had already owned it so she ended up negotiating to where you know she got to keep the trademark but she got to have her name added onto the project and she got like a, a very generous producer credit um so that that i found like an interesting tidbit as well but it's all pretty juicy. She talks a lot about, a lot about, or not a lot, but she talks a bit about Housewives too. She throws a little shady digs. Nothing groundbreaking in the Housewives world other than her deciding to leave because it was bad for the brand and she walked out on millions, but that there was the clause that they wanted to add in and she wasn't cool with that and she didn't want to be paid an episode rate. She wanted to be paid a, a seasonal salary. I guess because if there are shorter seasons, like think about it, if you're supposed to do a 22-episode season and then it ends up being a 15-episode season, then you only get paid for 15 episodes. And Bethany was probably like, nope, I want to get paid for a full season. And if there's going to be a full season, I don't care how many, what number of episodes I get. This is the amount that I want for the season. She's like, you know what I bring, you know what I deliver, blah, blah, blah. She definitely knows her worth. Um, maybe a little more than her worth, but (laughs) listen, she's, she's a shark and she makes money. She's good at making deals, but I don't know. I actually think it was a huge miss to not market this book specifically or not specifically but to also really market this book to real housewives fans because for me as a fan of housewives and a fan of bethany i was enjoying learning all of these other fun little tidbits like food porn and the wine and the big shot and her podcast and andy and i was having so much more fun learning all of those pieces than getting a lot of the regurgitated advice that she's giving and it's also like According to some of these deals, and I get it, she's very much like, here's what I did, do it or don't do it, trust what works for you. But it's also like, you know, because she's like, here's what to do and here's what not to do. Um, I'm not loving a lot of her business advice as somebody that, you know, understands the world of podcasting, that understands the world of having a wine line. And listen, I understand I'm small potatoes compared to her and her level of like status and fame or whatever. But like, come on. Even I, at my level, know some of these deals were bad or some of these decisions were really bad. But like I said, the book is juicy if you are a Housewives fan. Um, And I think it may be even a little empowering for you if you're starting a business, have a small business, have like a a pyramid scheme that you're running at home. Like, listen, I think this could help. There are are some good practical advice and lessons um, that I think are pretty solid. Um, It's out right now. It's called Business is Personal. It's in my uh, Amazon storefront. So if you guys go to amazon.com slash shop slash Zach Peter, Z-A-C-K-P-E-T-E-R, amazon.com slash shop slash, or dot com slash shop, yeah, slash shop slash Zach Peter, sorry. Um, Then you can go and order that and check that out there. 